Hello and welcome to the Half Court Press Podcast. I am Jimmy Watkins, the Nebraska basketball beat writer. He is Joel Lorenzi, the Creighton basketball beat writer. Today we got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. We got a lot of stuff going on. Creighton played basketball for real in front of people. Like we have eyewitnesses in the room who can actually confirm that it, that it happened. There's no more whispering about Iowa State. Nebraska played at Colorado. Didn't have to pay any money for Pac-12+, Plus, which is a nice surprise. And we're going to go through that stuff real quick, and then we're going to do season preview stuff. Joel, how are you doing? I'm chilling, man. I feel super swole after just wrestling with this damn rapper <laughs> from the protein bar, bro. But. Joel just had to grab some of the bi- some of the largest scissors I've ever seen to cut the, oh, I don't know, cut the straight jacket off of the protein bar. Yeah. He was eating. The bar got stuck to the to the wrapper. Uh, oh, one thing I also want to ask you about. You, you were on, uh, you followed me on the radio this week. <laughs> They asked me right before, right before, hey, what should we ask well? And I was like, eh, ask him what happened when we'll play one-on-one. What did, I didn't, I didn't listen back to it. How did they ask him? What did you say? They said, uh, I, I'm trying to get the exact word now, but they were like, well, Jimmy told us that he, he 360 dunked you or something, something crazy. I'm like, man, Jimmy could really be Steven Spielberg or something, bro. He could really be a director. Cause and I told him what happened. I'm like, yo. He beat me, but I was I was letting him shoot. I didn't think he had a strap in. This is how I get people. And he, he, this is how I get people. He you had fall behind strap, six bro. nothing real quick if you let me shoot. Um, that's funny though. I I thought that I thought that would be. I didn't know they would go that far with, with it. But I thought that would be fun. Yeah. Um, speaking of, speaking of dunking on people, Creighton beat the mess out of Drury. Yeah, as on, they should during that exhibition. Uh, was that Sunday they played that or Saturday? Sunday. Sunday. Um. Kind of like Shadron State a week ago. Like I don't want to take away a ton from from what you know beating a team that you should beat by eighty points. But what did you see? Is there anything that stood out to you from from <clears> that game? Um, rotations. I think minus Sharif Mitchell who didn't play because of uh, disciplinary reasons. I guess um, rotations for sure. Um, even at Francisco was the first off the bench, which which is probably gonna happen Monday too I mean maybe Sharif gets in before him but like I think it goes either way so just just knowing that Francisco is in the rotation for sure um then Mason I think Mason's in the rotation for sure and um he had a he had a couple of crazy rebounds like say what you want um it's Drury they don't play a guy bigger than six seven but he had a couple of crazy rebounds where I was like like yo, like that'll keep him in the rotation. I don't know how off, how off is it um, in the Big East, but but um, just see, seeing him hustle hustle that hard, like clearly he has. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it was it was more effort than I'd probably seen in any singular play from from anybody on the end. Um, and then um, just seeing uh, the touch, right? Because um, shooting. Shooting is shooting, no matter who you play, right? Um, obviously, they're peskier defenders, but um, I think a couple of the shots, like Trey Alexander took, who was a, a big question mark on the shooting front um, entering the season, um, a couple of shots he took translate. I mean, I mean, one super deep, um, and he was just get, getting spots and look really, really, really cool, um, which is I, I think encouraging for for people who wanted to see that leap and. Um, I just got to be a relief for the people around the program who were like, yeah, he's, he's made a jump. Yeah. And then um, Kaluma kind of did, he showed the same thing. I think um, really showed off the touch. Um, Mitty with turnarounds and uh, the three here and there and around the rim, especially because um, you can kind of tell that he like lacks the burst he had when he was 100%. And I don't know what percent he's at now, but it didn't seem and it doesn't feel like, like uh, he's at 100%, and especially with the way uh, uh, Mac is talking about him. So, <clears throat> Which I don't, I don't think is far away, but um, he himself was a little cautious, and um, I think I overheard him say like after the game, like, yeah, he could have, he could have dunked one or two of those, but you know, it was just chilling and um, still showed some good touch to make up for that lack of burst. I felt like so. Well, my takeaway from watching those highlights is you're gonna, you're gonna have a, a lot more fun <laughs> watching that team. Hell yeah, <laughs> than I will <laughs> watching Nebraska. Um, the the Colorado game, you can. I mean, the t- t- people who are going to, going to choose be pessimistic, and that's kind of, that's kind of Nebraska basketball fans into DNA is like assume that the that the worst going to happen, and then that's usually your prior priors will usually confirmed. Are worried that 
and rightfully so, that the team is shooting 12 for 49 from three um, in the first two exhibition games, and they're getting pretty decent looks at threes most of the time. But I, I, what my takeaway out of that game was just that they got punched in the mouth real quick. They fell behind 10 nothing. Yeah. They were down 26-9 at one point, and they were able to find a way to get it down to, I think it got as low as five. And they were just hung, hanging around being eight and 10 the rest of the way. And Colorado Rutgers pretty like they won 21 games last year. Sure. Uh, Dirk has said that he wa- he wa- he thinks they're a tournament team. Fred thinks they're a postseason team. So if you're hanging around with that kind of team and you're only using, I think Fred said after the game, 20% of your playbook, that's a good sign, man. Like I think that the offense will come, um, will improve as as they open the playbook up. But this this uh, preseason two game stint was about as like really backing up what they were saying during the off season. Like rebounding is gonna be better. Like last year against against Cotto, they beat the crap out of Colorado in that exhibition. They were able to three on them, but they gave up twenty three offensive rebounds. They gave up twelve this time, and three of them. Were in, only three of them were in the second half, and like three or four of them were on one possession where Oleg Koyanets was the only big on the floor. He actually looked pretty good in that game. I still don't think he's going to have a huge role on this team because he still has seems to put some weight on um, to be able to hang with, with Big Ten guys. But that's, that's really encouraging. And the fact that they can hold Colorado to, I, I forget, like, 40 something percent from the field and then ugly it up because that's because that's their identity they don't have to you know you know just shake the team down to their level offensively and if they if they get the shooting improvement which is a massive if because it never came last year really for anyone besides cj wiltshire but if they can be an average shooting team and this defense and rebounding stuff that we're seeing early is real I think Fred's kind of got something up his sleeve. Like, I think they can catch some people off guard. And because and, right, right now I saw uh, the Sports Illustrated rankings mm-hmm. where they do like the one to three, whatever, 353. Nebraska's like 148th, like like a bunch of mid majors. And stuff. like, there's no one on, on the earth <clears throat> expects this team to do anything. So when that's the case and your team plays hard, you can catch people. You can really catch people. It's an, it is human nature to see the last three years of this of this team's track record. Be like, they've won twenty four games in three years. Odds are, mo- most of the Big Ten teams that come into PBA or, or host them are be like, we've probably skunked them once. We've probably beaten them pretty good, and they're gonna let their guard down. And that's where th- this new this new identity, new ethos that they're preaching, and Chattel tell wrote today. Um, with for, well, it's, he wrote about it today. He sent as we got the story to our emails like before we started recording. So I think it will run tomorrow. So he wrote wrote about it tomorrow, but I read it today. That's what that's what Fred told him. That's what they're banking on. They got a bunch of old dudes. They got a bunch of t- big dudes, strong dudes, tough dudes, and they're gonna try to ugly it up. We'll see what happens. Yeah. We're speaking of ugly, four for twenty from from three is nasty. Four for twenty five the first game, or no, six for twenty five the first game, six for twenty four the second game. Yeah, it's and, bad. And so, so how much of a Wilshire and Tumanaga, the two best shooters on the team, are four for four for eight in those two games. This is a very small sample size, but it's not good. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, I know Derek Walker didn't play. What? How much of a? How much does he raise that ceiling? How much does he change that game? I think Derek could have. Uh, mid like the the nine offensive rebounds they allowed in the first half. There's fewer of those, um, and they still got beat up pretty good points in the paint. Why I think they allowed 42 points in the paint. Derek, you would like to think would mitigate some of that. He's just it's not that he's this incredible rim protector or whatever. It's just that he's played in the the well. They, they're not they've they've changed defense a lot, but he understands what the coaches expect back from him. Usually in the right spot and hot and he's strong. Like he may, makes. He makes his presence known down there, so you think he could he could mitigate some of that. Just it's just more to the point of being tough inside and all that stuff. Um, all right, let's talk season preview stuff next week. Like literally days from now, we can we could count hours if we wanted to. John the Rothstein se- will. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He will. Um, we're gonna play real games. Nebraska plays Maine. Fun. 
super fun, I guess. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know a damn thing about Maine right now. Uh, uh, Maine plays St. Thomas? Thomas, yeah. That's Minnesota? I think it's I think it's relatively new D1. They're like another uh, Catholic school, okay. I believe. So. Well, we're not going to waste a bunch of time. No disrespect. Look, Nebraska's lost a bye game every year. Uh, since they've since they've hired Fred, they lost their opener last year to Western Illinois. That's another like narrative that came out of this year's Colorado game is like last year they beat Colorado so badly that they just walked into Western Illinois thinking they were the shit, and that might have been why they lost that game. They won't be thinking that this time because Colorado, you know, you know beat them by eleven. So I sh- I should dismiss Maine, but I'm not gonna, gonna go get a deep dive scouting report on Maine. I want to just dive into what we think the season is going to look like, um, what the, you know, ceilings, floors, expectations, predictions, all that stuff, and we'll start oh with what it's what is what is it going to look like. So for like Creighton, you we talked about you got what your first glimpse of like Mac going through the rotations on Saturday. What do you think? Like how many deep are they going to go? How are they going to dis, uh, <coughs> disperse those minutes? What's the rotation going to look like, Joel? Yeah, and kind of along the same lines of you saying that Nebraska loses a bye game every, every year. Like, um, I don't think fans should expect um, um, the game to go like Arkansas Pine Bluff did last year, where they're trailing at halftime or whatever. Um, St. Thomas should should be a very comfortable win. I mean, the, the dynamic around this team has changed. It doesn't feel like this is a team that's going to have to have such a steep learning curve. There will be a learning curve for sure. Um, but I think that just comes with the expectations and whatnot. Now, in terms of the rotations, it feels like, I mean, at this point, it feels like I have an idea that that Mac isn't going to be so strict with the lineup. Um, will still be a couple, a couple that fans are probably like, yo, he should be playing. I know people, people are kind of divided, at least from what I've seen on Sharif Mitchell in so many minutes, especially with the emergence of Ben Schultzberg, but um, your boy Ben Schultzberg, my boy Ben Schultzberg, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, hey, I'll get behind the Ben Schultzberg movement. Um, but yeah, um, I, I'm also relatively a fan of Sharif. I mean, it makes sense um, playing him so much based on what he offers to the team and the holes he fills. Um, I think uh, uh, this is a question in my mail back, but um, you know, Sharif, I think um, still plays a, a lot of minutes um, for this team, 15 to 20 at least, like he's been the, the past season or so when he was fully healthy. Um, I think he played around 16 minutes a game last year in a few games he played. So um, I don't think that changes here. Um, this is a a backup small that um, lets you dig under guards, great guard defense. Um, it's really probably their best, like, Without seeing Trey Alexander's conference performance as a defender yet, um, based on the past, like that's their best guard defender right now. Um, just the intensity, the quickness, um, the aggression, and uh, apparently, I mean, they expect him. To, he he didn't shoot bad in his he few games didn't last take year. Very many. Yeah, but he was he was like a thirty five or thirty six percent shooter, which is fine. Uh, it, it's it's actually pretty solid and. Um, you know, I don't know if we expect the jump in volume or what or wherever he fits in in that case. We don't even know if he'll make a leap, leap in production. But I think the staff's okay with that. I think that they're just based on what he offers on defense. defense. Um, maybe just having the gravity to be a possible spot out up and, you know, fit next to these guys is enough for them. I don't think he needs to make a leap. And then, obviously, Farabello is pretty high in the rotation. Um, Mason Miller is pretty high in the rotation. Um, these are things that at least in Miller's case, and maybe even in Sharif's Char- Char- case, I don't think Fred Bell is going anywhere. But um, in Osu's case, they, I don't think they're concrete. Um, and Schultzberg has this insane type of year, like to where it's like impossible to to not um, play him. Then I think you see some minutes get adjusted, right? But um, things will be tough for Schultzberg in the early going, no matter how talented he is as a as a scorer and just as a point guard. Um, and a guard in general. And then I think Fred King is, is in a rotation for sure because they still got a spell. I mean, Mac mentioned it um, in the presser after the game the other day. Like, they still got a spell, Cogman. I mean, this is the guy that could really change their fortune 
Um, if he goes down, I mean, uh, obviously they got alternatives, but it makes this uphill battle for them and the expectations they have. Like, this is the one guy I feel like more than anybody on this team that if he goes down, like, they're kind of not screwed, but, like, they're, they're in a way different position. So um, they want to be able to spell him, preserve him as much as they can. This is one of the better big men in college basketball. and Coming probably an injury, too. Yeah, and probably probably the best anchor, best drop big in basketball, I think you could argue. So um, they want to spell him. Fred King is going to get 10 minutes a game, probably, maybe a, a few more than that. But um, I thought in the in the exhibition, like, he, uh, the minute the minutes him and Kogman were different, like, different. Like, he was in the game, like, he was, he was trying. Obviously, jury, jury don't a lot of, they don't, they don't have seven footers, but, like, he was really trying to put them in the cup. Like, he he wasn't playing with it. When he came to the game and he would get good position, like, he was going up. Even if he smoked a layup or whatever, um, he was drawing contact, he was maybe getting to the line or – he he just didn't care. Like he was going up. Um and I think that's encouraging for a guy who has only been playing basketball for so long. Um Max talked about it, like this is a dude who um he hasn't seen many people score on Cockburner in the post and Fred King does in practice. Um and it's something that they've kind of raved about. So it's an eyebrow raiser right there that Fred can get can get a bucket or two on Cockburner. To your to your point, Stoltzberg, like I just feel like he, if there, if this was a roster that needed that traditional sixth man, where it's like a dude who comes in and is just like, here's Got the, the offense for three to five yep. minutes, like yep. that that would be a neat role, like a neat fit for him as a role. But because it's going to be like so much staggering, like there's probably going to be mm-hmm. two or three of those the, starters, the starters on the floor yep. all the time. It just makes sense to play some of those guys who are like plug and play role guys like Sharif and Farabello a yeah. little bit more. And that you know, that, and Mason Miller's a great shooter. I think we'll we'll see. I think to your point, we talked about this last week. He's good injury insurance, but it might make more sense for Creighton to to save a year of eligibility for him. It, just, it might be hard to keep him off the court, but I see the vision of like if you want that guy to eventually like run your team, there's a, there's some value in keeping him off the floor this year. I don't know if they'll be able to, but that's an idea I had for Nebraska. We have seven guys that I, I am very confident will be in the rotation. It's Greasel, it's Manuel Bandamel, it's C.J. Wiltshire, it's Wilhelm Breidenbach, Derek Walker. Just this health care care re- thing they asked about. They, they asked on the radio this week. This week, uh, I, w- I was asking coaches just about this week. It's very much mums the word. I using context clues. Derek was at the game. The, the camera was on him very briefly pregame. He was moving pretty well. I don't think it's going to be a long-term thing. I hope it's not a long-term thing. I like Derek. He deserves to have a normal senior year. He's had enough of a a weird situation with, like, the, the, he had to sit out half of his first year here because of a, a rules violation at, at Tessie. But we're just going to assume Eric Walker's going to be around for the sake of this conversation. So the starters that we saw in Shadron State are probably going to be the starters on Tuesday. Again, assuming that Derek can can play and is okay. I don't know what's going on there at all. So that is your starters. And that's Jawan Gary, Casey Tomonaga, the first two off the bench. That's been what, what Fred has been doing. I think that's going to continue. And then it gets a little bit interesting because you got... Denham Dawson, who I think has made a strong case, strong impression with coaches. He got he's the the fact that he got here here uh, early early he was an early enrollee got here in January. <coughs> he helped the 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 identity shift shift of that Fred is trying trying to implement right now fits Denham Dawson very well. He's a scrappy, very athletic, uh, tries hard defensively like one of those dudes who like identifies as like a defensive player first. That's a very good thing. They're they're praising the work that he's done with his jump shot. I have to see these things before I believe them. So that's one guy who I think has a, a foothold into the rotation right now. But if we get to the point where he can't make shots, that maybe is a swing piece. And I see Ramel Lloyd or Jamarcus Lawrence sliding there. Um, Blaze Kikita is, I think, a guy like he's a matchup dependent sort of deal. Like if you're playing against a team that has a lot of size. He makes a lot of sense in that spot. I think Oleg looked better than him in both of the exhibitions. I'm not going to overreact to either of those performances. Um, 
I just think that Blaze has the body, and he's older, so he's more more he's played more basketball. So I would give that to him. So there's it's like seven, and then we're sort of just we're waiting to see matchup dependent, uh, development dependent, that sort of thing. N- the next thing I want to look at, Joel. This this is an interesting question for Creighton because I think it's going to be very jumbled. What like what do you think the scoring hierarchy looks like? If for, there is one, yeah, like who's going to lead the team in scoring? What does that benchmark look like for Creighton? You mean? Yeah, yeah. how's that um, offense going to look? I mean, you'll be hard pressed to find somebody that doesn't believe it'll be Trey Alexander at this point. Mm. I mean, I'm still mm. I'm still on the fence between Shaden. Sh- and 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 Trey now, now I think Ironman, he pl- he played in the offense right right he's never gonna force force any he doesn't force shots um he doesn't shot hunt um and he's uh I, mean, I don't know the the reason I had mentioned him as one of the names I thought could lead the team of scoring like leading up to the season is because he, he's just versatile as a scorer um got some shooting versatility. Um, he's a pick and roll ball handler. Like, there's few spots you can't put him in. He's rarely uncomfortable, on that end at least. And um, so yeah, that's why I thought he could maybe be a leading scorer. But, but um, I also mentioned Trey um in the months leading up because of you know the rumors around the program that he made this huge leap that he's one of the better shooters on the team. And you kind of seen some flashes of that on Sunday. And um. I think he has really good shot versatility too. I mean, it's probably one of his better traits as an NBA prospect now. Um, you know, just he had the mid range. Um, he has those shots that he likes to to get to the turnarounds. He has those cute shots that are in NBA bags, right? But um, now you're seeing him extend his range, and and obviously, obviously into the tough part of the schedule yet, but but. Um, even if he's an average shooter or even a solid shooter, like a 35% at his expected volume, I got to imagine that he's probably in the running for a leading scorer, especially, I mean, now he's dunking on people. I, I, he, he didn't have a single dunk last season. He, now he's, like, slamming Alex O'Connell's little brother, which was unfortunate for him. <laughs> but um, So, yeah, I think those are the two culprits. And then, um, I mean, you can't sleep on Carbunner. The only reason everybody knows I'm, I'm real high on Kaluma but I just don't know how this thing is going to play out. And so this thing being like the whatever, just a lineup from being a hundred percent or that, or well, that too. Okay. And, um, you know, I think Shireman and, and Alexander will be in more pick and rolls than Kaluma, which definitely helps them in their case. And then with Kalkbrenner, it's like, he's just going to get so many easy points off others drawing attention. Um, and I mean, even these dudes mentioned like when, when we were talking in New York, like they're like, you know, when we need to get a bucket, like, it's going to Kalkbrenner. Um, they're very confident in him. Um, and they don't, I mean, they don't even need to be. Like, he's going to get easy buckets off others getting double. I mean, you see, they threw him three lobs. I mean, I don't know how, how often that's going to happen when they play tougher teams. But but the lob and the dump down, it's going to be there. He's He's got easy points. So, I think he's he's running, but he's probably, like, the, the third leg in that, in that race. So I think for Kalkbrenner and Shireman, it's just easier for me to envision them scoring within the flow. Like for Shireman running out in transition, people are going to be looking like you have the ball. You're looking for him immediately because he's such a dead a dead eye shooter. Yeah. Clark Brenner in the lob game, and when like you said, when guys every time someone gets two feet in the paint, that's an opportunity for him to score at the rim, right? So, um, I think you're right. I mean, I'm you know me big Trey guy, so I, I I see that as well. But for he's a guy that I think can be maybe the guy I'd point to as the highest usage guy. Him and them and. And then the other guys, guys are the finishers, and they're going to do that very efficiently. And, and Shireman got a real, real green light, too, like kind of yeah. like how Hawkins had last year. I know they're going to try to use him in those those dual screen, those pick-and-pop situations. Like, he'll even be a screener at times. And I mean, he can pop probably with the same range oh, yeah. and green light with Hawkins, I imagine. So. And the, the thing about him that Hawkins wasn't as good at is that he can attack a closeout in just a, with a different kind of verve, right? Like yeah. Haw- uh, Hawkins was – a really good player in his own right, but he didn't have the creativity with the ball in his hands that that Shireman had. On the Nebraska side of things, it's an interesting question because because Sam's gonna have the ball the most, um, um, but but his job is going to be to set the table, and then he'll you know they figure, and this has been this has played out so far that he'll score within the flow. He showed he had a nice little 
series of post buckets against Colorado where he's just putting the smaller dudes um, on his back and he's got, you know, he hit the little like, like Luca one foot step back. He has a nice little jump hook. Um, he's just got an, a bunch, a nice array of shots around the rim. So he'll score that way. He'll score in transition. Bandamel was more aggressive hunting his own shot in that Colorado exhibition, which I thought was interesting and important. Um, that's a guy who they are banking to be a double digit scorer, which he, he was the last two years at, at SMU, but like barely like 10 point, whatever points per game. So the competition level is about to jump. We'll see how that translates. I like how he looked against Colorado. Uh, Jawan Gary, one of my, my notes after the, the Colorado scrimmage was Jawan Gary has taken 28 shots in the two games that Nebraska played this preseason. The second most on the team is 20, and I'm not necessarily sure that you want Jawan Gary to be the guy who's leading you in shot attempts. They appreciate his aggressiveness, and oh, they that's, need that's to. That's nasty, man. They, yeah, that's they, nasty. they need minute. him to be aggressive because. There are just going to be times like with this team because, as we've talked about a lot, not a ton of dudes who can break guys down off the dribble. Like you just need somebody to do something, so that can be a good thing, and that makes that aggression is like who Juwan Gary, Gary a basketball player, like the way he goes around, like goes after offensive rebounds, like he is like chasing the deed to his house, like that is that is super like fun foundational to who he is. You can't take that away, but at the same time. You might need to say, hey, man, like, can we rein in some of these crazy drives? He had a couple against Chadron State where he basically just threw the ball off the rim and caught it himself and then put it back, and you're not going to be able to do that against everybody. So I'm fascinated to see how that goes. And then we're talking shooters. Like, well, we should mention Derek as well because Derek had a, a, a career-high scoring average average last year. He broke the school record for field goal percentage, partially because because he take a ton of shots. He's pretty – uh selective he probably could have gotten the ball a little bit more i think that'll be an emphasis this year again assuming that he's going to be around um but yeah after that we're talking about the shooters i think if if wilhelm can make threes at a decent clip he can be in this conversation it's mm. and i don't think it but it's but the, the conversation is not like Wilhelm Reinbach 20 a game it's like no everyone's gonna be like around 10 yeah and that like if there are five dudes around 10 that's a big win win for this for this this team is you know there's they're gonna be searching for points they're gonna need it get really really bad um the next oh i didn't i forgot to look up some over unders i know nebraska's win total was like 11 and a half i would take the over on that um okay what do you think i'll look up creighton's over under for wins real quick but in the meantime joel what do you think uh the greatest strength is for that team Greatest strength, offensive parity. Uh, I mean, it's it's got to be obvious at this point, right? Like, um, you kind of know – well, you don't know where the defense stands. Stand. You know what it can at least – at least book Hulkbrenner at the helm, uh, running things. Obviously, they'll have some perimeter holes to patch up. up um, but I think that they're still like a top 30 defense. Um, but offense, man, offense is really the thing that can unlock this team. I mean, they should be having high-scoring outputs almost – Every other night, man. I mean, um, obviously you'll you'll face some Texas Techs and some Arkansas's, but Texas Texas really uh did Arkansas in. Um, so I'm not saying Creighton should, but um, Creighton should definitely uh hang some points on some tough teams and obviously like like beat the brakes off of like a St. Thomas or something. So, so um and you and you I mean these dudes dudes had highlight after highlight. Um, they just are so fluid in the pick and roll now because they have so many ball handlers. I mean, possessions rarely go dead. Um, and they just got so many options, man. Like, even, like you mentioned, like, um, take away Schultzberg. Like, they got plug-in guys who just make sense um, and elevate these lineups. And they got two or three starters on the floor at any given time. So, um, I got I to gotta think their offense is their greatest strength. Can't find their over-under for win totals, but I am seeing 25-1. to 1. To win the title, it's kind, it's kind of yeah. Let's, I'm gonna try and see how many teams. I'm have. betting guy. I gotta, I gotta tell y'all, I, I will rip, rip my arrow on FanDuel for real. Like I, <laughs> man, I, I just hate losing money, y'all. So, Twenty-five to one. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is on Draft DraftKings. Sure. Uh, eleven. Looks like there's eleven teams in front of them. That okay. Feels, that feels about right to me. Yeah. 
That feels about right to me. And like, that's something to be happy about if you're them. For I think. sure. That means you're you're in the inner circle of contention, or at least maybe in that that, yeah. that second layer. Um, the greatest strength for Brad, Brad is kind of like when the 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 coach about a good guy, and you're like, he plays hard. That's going to be what they have to do. That's that's their thing. It's their greatest strength, I guess, to put a word to it would be spirit. Like this team has to be super mentally tough, and it's going to be tested, man. Like that that stretch of schedule they have like where so it goes Maine, omaha they're gonna go to st john's we'll learn a lot there arkansas pine bluff then they go down to to florida for the mte where it's oklahoma who is i think could be a tournament team memphis or seton hall are going to be tough tough and then depending on who like you could get in that third game if you lose the first two but it, it, the, every other team every other team in the, the tournament is a is a high major so then it's Boston College. Then it's uh, you got. I'm not looking at the schedule, but there's Kansas State, there's Creighton, there's Indiana. Like that, you cannot let that stretch. If you lose, I don't know. Let's say seven of those games. It's or six of those games. You go. I think it's an eight game stretch. You go two and six. You can't let that break you. Because last year, they there were there were mitigating circumstances. They all they always point to the NC State game. That's four overtime. They lose. And they come back and Michigan beats the crap out of them and Auburn beats the crap out of them. And they told us after the fact that there were some guys who were sick, but it was just, it was clear that they like, they hit this, this stretch of really tough games and they did not respond very well to, to, you know, falling behind by, you know, eight to 10 points or, you know, they give up a run and it's just like, they kind of just like shoulder slump and it, it was over. That can't happen and because they're going to, there's going to be a ton of scoring droughts for this team this year. And there's going to be a ton of moments where they're going to like the, the other team is going to be more talented than they are. So they just got to claw and fight. And like, that's what Jawan Gary is all about. That's what Emmanuel Bandamel is all about. That's what Sam Grease is all about. So it has to be tenacity, mental toughness, all these. It's tough because these are all very hard to quantify qualities about a basketball team. I don't exactly know what it translates. I don't know that they know exactly what it translates to, but it, if you're in, you're in a clean game, it's a, it's a good quality to have, if, you know, if you, but they have to, at some point, like they got to surprise somebody earlier, just like something. This has been a theme for Nebraska football too. You got to have something go your way and that, you know, have that be a snowball effect so that that, that spirit doesn't get broken early on. If you, like if if you're going into Creighton, Indiana, and you've lost you know three in a row, and then Creighton and Indiana kick your ass, that's a really tough thing to bounce back from. Really tough thing to bounce back sure. from. I, that's so it's their greatest strength right now. We're, we're gonna see. We're gonna see that that will be tested mightily. Uh, what is the thing that I guess we call it the greatest weakness for Creighton that you think would be a reason why they fall below their expectations? Greatest weakness, um, I think one of them should be shooting consistency. Like, is mm-hmm. the is the exhibition real? Um, what does it mean? I think while I think a lot of it will translate, like, will it hold up, um, stuff like that. But I don't think it's their greatest weakness. I I mean I talked about the weakness I'm watching out for, um, leading up to the at least leading up to the season, and they didn't do it too much. In the exhibition, which is obviously his jury, they could toy around with them at a certain point, right? But um, what I'm looking for is um, overpassing, mm-hmm. like having so many tools out there that you're, you know, um, trying to find the best best look that might not even be possible, the best look that might not even exist, instead of just taking good looks, settling for already really good looks, um, things like that. Um, because then you that's how you start losing possessions I think uh and it could be I mean against an aggressive team that could mean turnovers really really and um it's it's just things that the over overpassing could feed into then losing out on possessions and it's really the primary way I see this team losing possessions I I don't know if it's their greatest weakness I mean it's it's probably the thing I'm looking at the most frankly it's <clears throat> this is people we talk. I think this is one of the first pods we did where we were talking about. Everyone was talking about, oh, there's only one ball. How are they gonna all like? It's not that. It's the other thing, like you said. Yeah. It's we're not worried about Ryan Nemhard and Trey Alexander coexisting because they're gonna like 
fight over the ball at mm. mid court. Yeah. They're they're gonna they're aware that that narrative exists, and they're gonna try gonna try to accommodate each other because other because version of last year's tears team Trey had the ball all along, mm-hmm. and now here's this new guy new guy Shireman. Look at him throw a head, pass over his head and do the goggles thing. Maybe that guy should yeah. have the ball more, right? Like he should be able to hey. do stuff. And so everyone's just kind of like, it's just like, oh, excuse me, oh, excuse me, and like somebody's <laughs> got to make a decision. Somebody's yeah. got to cut in there, and then everyone lives with the results, right? Yeah, and and Shireman to me is the key in that in unlocking. Mm-hmm. And really limiting that, um, because this is the guy that's probably your second or third pick and roll ball handler on any given night, and really, this is probably their most talented passer, um, at least in terms of being flashy and she and maybe most ball creative, creative player. Sure. Yeah, yeah, like that. So this is a guy that really, if he's decisive, then it feels like the rest of the lineup will will follow suit. Nebraska weakness is. Uh Bucket, talent? Get, bucket getting, yeah, sure. talent, sure. Bucket getting, is is maybe falls under the same umbrella. It's just like at some point, so that they the that this team is built with the idea that okay, we're gonna be close within the last two minutes, and that's when teams who have younger players in the Big Ten are gonna be like, ah, what's going on? But you know what those dudes also have? They have dudes who can dri- dribble past your dudes, <laughs> and like you don't don't have so. What like okay so this is where I like this is where I will be watching the Juwan Gary thing very closely like if everyone's just trying to run the system and and move the ball along but that the other team is locked in defensively as all teams are at the end of games like that and it's, it comes time where they're looking around at each other it's like okay somebody's got to do something Juwan Gary's you know it's Juwan Gary time <laughs> hyphen Juwan Gary what like does, is that good is that who you want to have those and like Sam Griesel is the is the post game good enough for, for that to be like your you know he's the closer kind of deal and if you if you want that to be the case he's gonna have a size advantage so you can throw him the ball and have him back somebody down what happens when somebody sends two at him if he gets really good at that are you gonna have enough shooters on the floor that that teams respect to make that um to make that a disadvantage for teams if they decide to send two at Sam. Emmanuel Banamel, like, had a nice behind the back step back into a mid range jumper that went in against Colorado. How often is that shot gonna gonna go like at a certain point ba- basketball has become like what can you create for yourself at the end of games? And the answer for Nebraska, I'm pretty sure, is not a lot. So you need your shooters to make the shots that you create for them. Maybe even make some tough ones. You need that that Sam Griesel post game to translate really well. You need Juwan Gary's drives to to amount to something. And you know, one thing that I that could be a weapon there is his his relentlessness on the glass. Like the some teams are so concerned about everything that everything that's in with the ball all lames that it would be easy for him for him to cost. But just when the clock's winding down, or when the game clock is, when the game's getting tight, I just really don't know what happens. That's that's the biggest thing that I'm that I'm watching. Uh, two more things. We'll divvy this. We'll make these two different things. Creighton ceiling, Creighton's floor. Creighton ceiling obviously is probably Final Four. I think it would take a little more than fans are letting off. Obviously, if the, the ceiling, fans- if the ceiling is Final Four, why isn't it national championship? Man, I, there's just some really good teams like college basketball this year. Um, I think there's, there's, there's. You definitely have to have have beer before, right? To 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 have an advantage, advantage when it comes. Um, there's just so many. I mean, getting to a Final Four already is like for sure. There's luck. There's uh, you got to consider matchups. Um, health. you you have to be on. Yep, health. There's just so many factors that make even an Elite Eight feel impossible, right? Let alone a Final Four. Let alone a damn national championship. I mean, I think North Carolina last year is a perfect example of how much has to go your way to to get that far. But at least North, North Carolina has one of the best, best big in the country. Um, Caleb Love played like one of the best guards in the country at the right time, um, and it just has such a good a good score, right? And um, obviously Creighton has one of the most talented cores in the country. I mean, I think there was a list that came out yesterday i don't know who wrote it it might have been cbs and all five of their starters were 
were in the top 100 mm-hmm. in college basketball. And I don't think there was another team um, that could say that. As much talent as there is, um, I don't know. I mean, you've watched years of basketball. Like, the most talented team doesn't always win, especially when this is their, their first year together. It just it feels like you're, you're putting a lot on this team to expect them to get a national championship. Um, I think if they were together for more than a year, um, I would go ahead and give them the green light. And I'm not saying they can't, right? But if I had to make my bet, it's probably on Final Four, Elite Eight, probably Final Four, really. Um, and that's high praise for them. That's, I mean, who doesn't want to be in the Final Four, They've right? Never been there before. Yeah. So, yeah. so, um, so that's probably selling for me in their, their their floor. You asked, right? Their floor, um, their floor probably comes being lower in the in the East than people who imagine maybe third or fourth in the Big East. Um, fourth is like like really hard to imagine. I can't imagine three teams shaking out better. Right, than I them. see Villanova, UConn after that. Yeah, I, I mean even you could probably toss. I think Xavier and oh yeah, and UConn are Xavier. interchangeable. Um, Bagman, Sean Miller. But yeah, fourth would be crazy to me. I mm-hmm. think that would be a nightmare for Creighton fans who see this team as the best team in the league. Um, honestly, third is probably a more realistic realistic floor. Don't think it happens, but. Um, that would be their floor for sure, and then, um, and yeah, I mentioned it. Before. So that's that's the, the thing for me for them. That's the that's the. Where were they? Where were they in that? What's your prediction? I'm really high team, man. I I really think they're elite eight or or final four for real. Um, I think it comes together. They got vets, um, and that's such an important part of you know how the factors shake out, right? Is having vets, um, like Farabello, Shireman, guys that have played a lot of college basketball, um. So I think things will, I mean, barring any injuries, like I think things can really go their way. Um, and then I think they're a top two team um, in the Big East standings for sure. On the Nebraska side of things, <laughs> I mean, the floor is, the floor is already there, right? They're the team in the Big Ten. Uh, Fred gets fired. Everything gets reset um, looking for a new coach. It would be, this is, I don't know, like, there's not a ton of, Sam Grizzle's like the only player on this team who has real ties um, to the area. Him and Cale Jacobson, who might actually play a little bit this year. I should have mentioned him during the rotation conversation. Um, But, like, if this, if Fred gets fired, I feel like this entire team is transferring. So that would be the worst case scenario, obviously. The ceiling, I could, again, I, I watched these two, these two games and hearing Fred say, like, like, not worry about the offense. We really haven't done anything yet. I, if he's got something up his sleeve and he can put together a decent offense, I could see them winning, like, going 500, maybe even a few games over 500, get, like, a CBI or NIT situation. If you're, like, 10th or 9th or 10th in the Big Ten, like, you're going to get a postseason invite to something. So that would be the ceiling. I have, like everything else in life, I think they fall somewhere in the middle. I think when I sat down to, to Sam to do our like pre season, we went through the schedule real quick, and he just said, "Tell me the games that you think that they are more likely to win than not. Tell me the games that you think they are more likely to lose than not. And then if there's a toss up, there's a toss up. I think I said there was like ten games that they were more likely to win than not, and then maybe four, five, or six toss ups. So let's say they split those." and they win 12 to 13 games. And then at that point, it becomes an aesthetics conversation. Like, Fred, did you like did this team look more competitive in the games that they lost? Are they any closer to, to climbing towards um, you know, at least the middle part of the Big Ten than they were before? And it's, you know, what right now they only have one kid in their 2023 recruiting class. Like, what's coming for the future that you think – it gives me hope that you can keep building on this, right? And what? How does Wilhelm Breidenbach develop? How does CJ Wilcher develop? The guys who are, who are going to be here for a couple more years. How? How do they look? Um, so okay, Joel says Creighton, Elite Eight slash Final Four, Big East champs or thereabouts. Um, I say Nebraska. Meh. <laughs> not what anyone wants to hear, but but not as ugly as it is last year. Uh, um, Joel, do you have anything else? Is there? I like your shirt. This uh, Popovich. Kirk. He got like a a presidential yeah. campaign shirt I'm about for to, Popovich I'm about to paint and over Steve the 2020 Kirk. and make it 2024 to keep the shirt. 
keep the shirt relevant. Uh, do you want to give me a West Side Gun album take real quick? A West Side Gun album take? We were kind of talking about this. Yeah, uh, we were texting text. this week. Jimmy thinks this is his best take it's somehow. So good. It's um, so good, man. I only liked like five songs off the first listen. I think a couple of them are probably his best songs in recent memory. But um, I don't know, man. I don't really know if I was high on it. Uh, like I, well, I definitely wasn't as high high as you were on it. Talib Talib and most up to read. No, yeah, that's, that's, one of the, that's one of my favorite songs. That's that's yeah. one of the songs I think is of his best in recent memory. But the album as a whole just it wasn't I super the whole moving thing. to me, man. I saved the whole thing. Are you serious? Yeah. I saved the whole thing. I don't know. I think this is the Creighton of West Side Guns. Oh my God! Collection. You think it's the Nebraska? Jesus Christ! Of Creighton of West Side Guns. Man, let's just discography. Let's look at his discography right now in the tapes. He dropped in no, recent memory. We don't because, need to do that. No, we're gonna do that <laughs> because there's no way you're this confident in saying this. I love it, dude. Dude, okay. Hitler words, Hermes, eight. It's crazy that they made they made toes though. By the way. Yeah, I mean, some rappers are just. Yeah, I mean, th- you know what? There's really not a huge difference in gun. And young boy, in terms of oversaturating the market, but this yeah. is just better sonically. So we don't care. I mean, as rap heads, we don't care. But when you look I'll back at it, like feed me, yeah, like when we look at back at it, like Griselda is actually pretty sick for for how often they drop. But that was really good to me. Um, I think Who Made the Sunshine was a better tape. Um, that was yeah. two years ago. So for Paris, which I think is like his album, um, came out two years ago. Ago it was better. Peace Fly God, which was earlier this year, right, I think good. that was better. That was- so I mean Jimmy dog like come on what is it what's what's this uh what's the phenomenon called when you like forget recency bias recency bias it dog might be. like this is it might be this is like when they call Kawhi what, the best player in the world because they I, just won a championship dog come that's on what I played on the way in here I'm gonna play it on my way out of here I mean I feel you but that's been the podcast hope you're ready for the season because it's coming I'm Jimmy he's Joel keep keep it geared with everything we're doing at Omaha.com and the Omaha World Herald please subscribe to our podcast and check me out on LinkedIn. <laughs>